Welcome to part two of this wonderful conversation with Dr. Messelson, Dr. Walker, and Ambassador Batsanov on the Biological Weapons Convention at 50. Diplomacy Live Broadcast. Live. John, if I if, if I may turn to you, uh, these are some compelling arguments. You know, one would think if looking from the sidelines, uh, like I, for instance, would be studying this period, that it would have been the pharmaceutical industries that perhaps had uh, a role to play to avoid uh, verification and perhaps had a, pl- a role to play in, in developing this policy. But uh, it, it, these are uh, very persuasive arguments by, by Matthew that uh, actually it, it is in the interest of pharmaceutical industry to protect the nature, the, the, the science that is behind uh, what they're developing. Could you share uh, the, 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 the insights from, from coming from, from London, but also one would imagine in Germany, in France, in Switzerland, countries that have very strong pharmaceutical industries, um, they would have an interest in having something that protects the science that is behind their, their, their discoveries. John, please. Yeah, thanks. I mean, there were a number of issues um, that concerned the pharmaceutical biotech industry. And certainly in the UK, uh, we certainly had a far better and closer relationship with industry than our US colleagues. I mean, Matt, Matthew's mentioned the, the problems there with pharma. Now, we made an early decision to, to work with it, industry, primarily because we had the very good experience of working with the chemical industry during the CWC negotiations. We worked extremely closely with the main trade organization and individual companies. It was, of course, the CIA, uh, the Chemical Interests Association in the UK uh, for the chemical side. So from the outset, now even going back to the Varex days, we started our practice challenge inspection program and we managed to get uh, four companies to to agree because they were interested at a number of levels. I think if, if we were to ask them honestly, they would rather this didn't happen. But if it was going to happen, they would like to be involved and consulted to ensure that their core interests were taken into account. And that was certainly one of the the main objectives of our inspection exercise program was to see that if we could provide enough information and access to a range of facilities uh, from research and development through to large scale production, that would satisfy inspectors, uh, but also reassure industry that its core interests could be protected. And the essential message in our program was that, yes, we could protect it, but we had four exercises the first one was exploratory. The second one, um, the inspectors probably got too much information because the company did feel rather anxious at the end of it. So we changed the procedures a little bit. And the third exercise, um, the inspectors weren't very happy at all. I was the chief inspector, but the company was very happy because we'd probably taken it too far to protect. And then in the fourth exercise, we got the balance right. Um, now, we had regular dialogue with the Association of the British Pharmaceutical Industry and UK Bioindustries Association. And they were certainly much less negative um, than the US were. Um, certainly the, the German industry was a bit leery, but there was none of the same level of hostility um, that we encountered in the US. And I had a couple of meetings with pharma representatives to go over the UK experience. Um, and it didn't really convince, which was unfortunate. I mean, one example, we had an international meeting in London of pharmaceutical manufacturers, the International Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association, I think it was called. And this was not long after the um, the uh, UK-US uh, Russian Federation trilateral visits to industry, which had partly set the, the, the hair running on this one because the US had to let uh, Russian visitors into two Pfizer sites, which didn't go down well. And that was a little bit like the fisherman's tail that kept getting bigger. And every time it was told about how damaging this had been to to US or to the Pfizer in particular, and this was seen as an exemplar of what might happen under a future protocol. Whereas our industry was quite content, and uh, we had an inbound Russian visit to one of the same facilities where we had conducted a practice biological inspection for the BWC the week before. In fact, in fact, the UK team was much more intrusive uh, than when I led them than the Russian team that came the following week. And at this international meeting I mentioned in London, when the pharma rep was complaining about all of this, uh, quite unbriefed, uh, unsolicited, uh, the representative from Evans Medical said, I don't know what your problem is, 
we handled this easily. Uh, we just don't see what the issue is. They were concerned about reputation for sure, that um, association with biological weapons was not a good thing. But equally, the reputation had been seen to obstruct something that was seen as important, was something they took into account. So overall, our experience with pharmaceutical biotech industries was very positive. And we wouldn't have imagined in the UK of trying to embark on such a thing without talking to one of the key uh, and most important stakeholders. They had a lot to advise us. We got a lot of useful information about what to think about. Uh, and we were able to persuade industry that they could, they were reassured that we had their interests at heart, but they could see that we had our own objectives, which was an effective protocol. And I'm quite convinced we were able to square that particular circle. One of the few circles that were in fact squared in that whole episode. What John has said is very important. Yeah. Thank you. you. See, there uh, was no Bob like, Mikulak yeah. in the case of the BWC. Nobody called any of the CEOs. Bob had called the CEO at DuPont. In the case of the BWC verification protocol, Bob was not in charge. And uh, nobody made contact with the head of any of the big pharmaceutical companies. As I said, we were deceived by pharma. That's such a pity looking back uh, and, and especially the past 20 years um, that have uh, passed in, in perhaps longing of what could have been. Sergei, uh, is, is it a similar situation uh, in terms of perhaps Russia right now, as much as you can, you can tell you're not an, uh, an active diplomat uh, at the moment, but looking at the past period, um, has there been uh, this kind of uh, a dialogue internally in the policymaking when it comes to biological to chemical uh, with uh, the pharmaceutical industries uh, in Russia? Uh, my apologies. Are you asking about biology or chemistry now? Well, it would be interesting. I mean, bi the Biological Weapons Convention is the framework of our discussion. But yeah, obviously, uh, okay. there's, a, there, there's a lot of um, similar thinking, complementary thinking into. So, um, yeah, as you wish. Mm -hmm. Well, frankly, I'm not sure about uh, the current situation, that I know it uh, well. Uh, of course, uh, just looking at, um, let's say, composition of Russian delegations to various uh, BWC events uh, in Geneva, you can uh, conclude that those uh, responsible for uh, industry issues uh, are coming. Uh, so uh, I can assume that there is uh, some kind of a dialogue. We actually started the dialogue, uh, and it was a rather uh, decisive and, I think on balance, useful step. Uh, after the second BWC review conference, which uh, adopted the first generation of uh, CBMs, uh, we decided uh, in Moscow to reach out to our biological community, which wasn't easy. And uh, a number of uh, ministries then were afraid of taking lead. Finally, the foreign ministry uh, did take a lead and I had to negotiate uh, the modalities uh, in a number of higher uh, level uh, institutions, but, but we made it then. The experience was not uh, in all respects, uh, let's say, successful, but nevertheless, we opened up that uh, cluster uh, and uh, this way or the other started working and, and, and some of that remained. However, um, I have a feeling that after the collapse of the uh, talks on the protocol, uh, for the BWC, uh, that kind of um, uh, involvement uh, and the issues discussed uh, have uh, somehow diminished uh, their importance and, uh, let's say, uh, intensity. 
Thank you, Sergey. Um, Matthew, uh, I had actually the privilege of, of, of being accepted at Harvard at one point, and I actually went uh, looking for a place to live. And some friends that were taking me around this whole area of Cambridge, uh, at once we stopped at, a, at a, an intersection somewhere between MIT and Harvard. Uh, and it was not a very, uh, you know, an intersection that one would take note of. But they said, do you know that about two and a half percent of the world's GDP is with headquarters uh, at this intersection? So companies that are pharmaceutical industries that have a headquarters uh, there. Uh, and that's understandable. I mean, the, what, I, what I would like to go into next is the incredible advances in the life sciences uh, that has opened up over the past well, 20-ish years, the past 10 years really with CRISPR-Cas9 uh, as the, the, the possibilities that that opens and, and genome uh, editing in, in, in general in terms of synthetic biology um, uh, and the possibilities uh, that are there, AI folding uh, proteins, you know, and discovering new toxins. Uh, what do you think uh, of... Um, how biology can protect itself again uh, in, in, in these new circumstances that it finds itself from being weaponized? Well, there are three different sources of danger that are biological. One, obviously, is nature. We see now this worldwide pandemic and a totally inadequate response to it, and there will be more pandemics, conceivably even one that kills many more people, or even worse, that has debilitating after effects. Because if a virus should appear with serious debilitating effects, for example, for example, on t cognition, the number of people who get infected in general is much larger than the number of people who actually die. So you could imagine a virus that cripples the cognitive capacity of, of our species. And we're not doing anything intelligent about that. And I could go on and on because I think I know what to do. So we need to do that. Please do. I mean, it needs to be heard. If well, you can, it's simple hygiene. Do. It's not vaccines. It's hygiene. It's filtering the air in places where people congregate with proper HEPA filters. You don't have to do it everywhere. You just need to get the transmission coefficient below one, and then you can't have a spreading pandemic. You'll have local outbreaks. And air filtration in bars, theaters, churches, schools, it's not that expensive. Just as we decided to make people uh, make pure water, clean water available so as to not transmit diseases like cholera. We need to make clean air available. So there's that. Now the next is bioterrorism, the next threat. I'm ticking off three different sources of possible threat. Well, we had the anthrax letters. It's getting on to, what, like 20 years ago. There hasn't been a single copycat, even though that episode showed that it's easy to do and it kills people, but there's not been a, now tomorrow morning I may read in the newspaper, but the fact that this has gone on for so long after so dramatic a demonstration that should have caught the imagination of anybody who wanted to do this, it didn't happen, it hasn't happened. What does this tell us? I think it tells us that the key element is intent. If there had been anybody with reasonable technical knowledge who wanted to do this again, it would have happened again. But it hasn't. And that's very important. We train millions and millions of people to use high explosive weapons. And so if you have a terrorist motive, probably you've been trained to use by uh, chemical, rather, I'm sorry, explosive weapons, and we do see a lot of that, gun violence and so on. So I think that for bioterrorism, the lesson is don't hype it. Don't do anything which creates intent. So, so I'm rather displeased with there being too much public hype 
about dangers of bioterrorism. That kind of hype doesn't get anything actually done anyway. So now the third possible area, which I think in a long-term perspective is by far the most hazardous. As you point out, we have CRISPR-Cas9 and we'll have even more powerful technologies or ways of applying CRISPR as time goes on. Already we know that it's possible to replace a detrimental gene with a good one. For example, if your hemoglobin gene makes hemoglobin S, you have sickle cell trait or sickle cell anemia, depending on whether you're homozygous or heterozygous. So it's perfectly reasonable to replace that gene in your progeny with a wild type gene, hemoglobin A. And then none of your children will have this rather nasty disease of sickle cell uh, trait or, or, or disease itself. So that's fine. But now there's the further question. What about engineering the human genome to make us more competent, more capable, more healthy? Not the replacement of a known bad gene with its normal type, but with an improved kind of gene. Now the problem here is that the products of most genes, which are proteins, interact in an immensely complicated way with other proteins. Changing partners, very complicated. It's called the interactome. So you need to ask, as we move into the future of genetic engineering, not this year, not next year, not for 10 years, maybe not for 50 years, maybe not for 100 years, but we hope that there's a long future for our species. What we might lose, what, what, what might we lose by changing our genes? Well, the most precious thing we have is our humanity. What's our humanity? Is it our sense of awe when you look at the sky? Is it the ability to be moved by a Mozart Requiem? Is it compassion? Is it kindness? We don't even know what it is, except that when I say we don't want to lose our humanity, I think everybody would agree with that. Furthermore, what's the genetic basis of our humanity? In other words, what I'm getting at is we need to learn more about the basis of those things in our genetic makeup because clearly our humanity is determined not only by our uh, environment but also for sure by our genes. Trees and dogs don't have humanity, though some people might argue about dogs. So I think that in the long term, the genetic future of our species is going to be a very major problem. Matthew, if I may just follow up quickly on, on, on this, because uh, in the third factor that you mentioned, uh, it's no longer, I mean, the, the second is terrorist and terrorist organization can be of many different kinds, state sponsored or, or individually ideologically driven. But in this third category, uh, we, we have even individuals who can play with this and, and really cause quite a lot of harm. To come back to the Biological Weapons Convention, is it possible for it to be contained uh, or, or taken within this regime complex of the Biological and Toxin Weapons Convention, or do we need some complementary uh, um, legal elements to, to deal with this? Broad types of threat. One would be from actual state programs, or at least large organizations, possibly criminal ones, and the other would be the activities of uh, mis misguided individuals fooling around. I, I'll tell you something that impressed me very much. I, I was with some friends and we were talking about the problem of verification in general. Let's say you have a verification scheme and someone points out to you that there's one way in which it could be circumvented. And therefore, what's the point of having it in the first place? And here's an intelligent response to that that was told to me by uh, Nikita Smirovich, who, together with Bob Mikulak, ironed out many of the details in the Chemical Weapons Convention. Supposing you have, a, at a government level, a committee which is deciding whether or not to support a program, let's say, of biological weapons. And there are different points of view around the table. And then someone says, well, 
if we do this and it's found out there's going to be a big political cost and then someone else at the table says yeah but there can't be any political cost because there's no verification agreement for this this activity and then someone else at the table says oh no you you may not have known about it but there is at least in principle there's a verification procedure a challenge procedure and so you have to take into your consideration do you really want to engage in this activity when there's at least a possibility that inspectors will show up that might change the views of some of the officials who are making the decision in the first place i know this is not a ironclad argument but i think it has merit if you can be sure that your program will never be detected that's one thing if someone who is involved in decision making can point out that yeah but it might get detected that might be just enough to dissuade the people who are making decisions from going ahead it's not a big deal but it's something it, it is john uh, a common um, a friend who is very active in 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 the uh, global biosecurity conversation philip alenzos uh, and and colleagues uh, has recently authored uh, an article on um, how they conducted a thought experiment really uh, with a company that use with uh, uses ai machine learning um, uh, and the company focuses on uh, providing uh, medicine, therapeutic um, uh, medicine to um, uh, find what is a toxicity by using these machine learning methods and to be able to uh, put it to the side, to be able to negate it. What they thought, what they, what they did was the opposite. They said, okay, let's try the opposite. And instead of uh, penalizing toxicity, to award it and just to see what, what happens. They put this algorithm to work uh, for a few hours. They gave it publicly available uh, data. And in just a few hours, it came up with 40,000 molecules um, that are as uh, or more toxic than VX. Uh, where are we with this? Uh, what, what, how do we deal with this? Well, first of all, I don't think that's a new problem because um, High throughput screening in the pharmaceutical chemistry industry has been around for decades. Um, companies have whole libraries full of highly toxic chemicals that they have found whilst trying to find the ideal drug to treat a whole host of conditions. So in principle, that's not a new problem. Um, all these toxic materials have been known about and disregarded because they have such high mammalian toxicities. They can't possibly be used as a therapeutic drug, so the company will just discard it and keep it in a library. Um, so the technology may make some of this quicker now, that, that may be true. But I think we have to avoid what Matt was talking about in the context of the bioterrorism risk. That there's, there's a terrible danger of just saying, oh, my goodness, look at this terrible technological development. It's all doom and gloom. And all these technological developments can be instantly translated into clear commercial or in this case, nefarious applications. That's not always the case. The history of weapons technology since the end of the Second World War has shown that it takes a long time to get where you need to be. Um, that was one of the reasons that the UK gave up its BW program in the 50s, is that the attempt to develop an effective weapon ran into all kinds of technical challenges. So we gave it up. Now, that's not to say that with more time, application and resources, those problems would not have been overcome and a weapons program uh, would have ensued. But I think we need to have a sense of balance and in proportion of a lot of these things. Now, one of the key defend the values of the BTWC is the general purpose criteria in Article 1, that any hostile use of any biological material, which encompasses all of these developments, um, is illegal. And that goes back to, to Matt's point about uh, if we do this, it's illegal. Someone has to be able to point this out. Uh, now, whilst you can catch them at it, and then do something about it, of course, are separate questions and quite challenging questions at that. But we do have uh, defenses. I'm fairly pessimistic that the BTWC itself will ever create something that can be a useful and constructive forum for discussing these sorts of problems and taking real steps to contain them. 
Um, I wish it were not the case that it would be the ideal place to have a forum, as we've seen in the OPCW, just because you have one doesn't make handling compliance issues any easier. Um, so let's not get too excited about the, the risks of the technological developments. The other thing to remember here, and it's something that uh, the UK was always keen to point out uh, in my time in our various working papers, that these developments bring benefits too. Um, better detection, better treatments, um, better diagnosis. So we have better tools for dealing with the consequences of, of misuse as well. So that's something we need to uh, um, remember. It's not all just the, the hostile um, and appropriate uses, there's beneficial uses of this technology too. Uh, and um, even with these beneficial uses, it still takes some considerable time for the widespread application to become the norm I mean, we heard during the protocol negotiations, for example, that DNA vaccines were the way ahead. Well, not quite. Um, true in that case, uh, gene editing to deal with various genetic diseases has taken a long time to, and it's still not widespread. So I think we just have to bear these caveats in mind. Thanks. Uh, Sergey. well, John is, is pessimistic, um, uh, rightfully so. I think that for me, just a few years of being exposed to this discussion, and uh, I certainly would be wary. But perhaps do you think, um, and, and again, from your experience from the OPCW and the, the negotiation of the CWC, one of the key things that might come out at the ninth review conference coming up in, in December, hopefully, is some kind of a science and technology review mechanism, something that has been uh, lacking in the BWC. Do you think that perhaps this is, um, it would be enough uh, if it comes out and let's see how it comes out, if at all, uh, probably in a, in a hybrid format. But do you think it is possible to discuss these issues in an effective manner from the frame of mind of biological weapons in a science and technology review mechanism, a science advisory body or panel, however it is called? Uh, yes, but before that, if I may, um, to follow up on what uh, John said about toxicity, um, you know, you can have, it, it's, it's, it's a normal, or it used to be, I hope, a normal process of uh, selection of um, uh, potential uh, chemical warfare agents. And it has long been indeed discovered that you can have thousands of very toxic uh, substances or uh, agents, uh, much more toxic than uh, VX, for example. But they, it's, it's not enough to make them attractive from a military point of view. They would be tested for that, uh, including their uh, stability as uh, molecules, uh, including many, many other uh, qualities, uh, and most probably rejected. So uh, now, do, do you have to keep an eye on, uh, on those things? Uh, I think so. But the question is, uh, how much uh, resources uh, you would find necessary uh, from not just a financial point of view, but uh, the point of view which is important for us uh, to devote to that. Uh, so yes, uh, we should um, uh, keep, uh, keep these things uh, in mind. And then uh, the danger, uh, potential danger, is not necessarily uh, in the toxicity, and that is the amount of uh, uh, agent you need to apply to uh, a particular individual in order to make uh, that individual sick or dead or uh, crippled. Uh, I think it is a much uh, wider uh, issue, therefore. Uh, I have no doubt that the Biological Weapons Convention should have a much uh, stronger, much uh, sustainable, much uh, constantly working system of uh, uh, scientific and technological review. Uh, 
I hope that it would be possible, it should be possible to invent something uh, for the next review conference. Now, would that solve the problem? I don't think so. It would help solve the problem. Uh, it is um, a pity that nowadays you can often hear, including from the civil society, from the academic society, uh, this, um, uh, let's say, negativistic approach to the whole idea of the protocol. Uh, something like, oh, that protocol which um, was dubbed uh, in 2001, it's a uh, history, there's no point in returning to that, uh, the, it, it cannot be a solution, and so on and so forth. Now, maybe in the form and shape in which it existed in 2001, uh, it may be true. But uh, I think that in, in addition to uh, scientific and technological review mechanism, which should, I think we, it should combine uh, two things. It should combine uh, very uh, in-depth scientific analysis, which cannot be done by uh, a committee of the whole of uh, di diplomats from uh, uh, all states parties. It has to be something more permanent, more uh, limited. Smaller. Uh, smaller, yes, but also, also, it is important that a committee of the whole uh, receives those results on a regular basis uh, and uh, has a good opportunity to discuss and consider that because uh, it is important in order to uh, spread the results, whichever they are, uh, into scientific communities in respective countries and in, let's say, political decision-making communities uh, in respective countries. So I think both elements are necessary uh, and I think both approaches uh, could well be combined instead of arguing about which is better and which is more effective. Uh, and, yet, and yet there should be a process leading to the revival of uh, talks about the protocol, but maybe to some extent we should start, we should go back to the drawing board uh, and discuss the whole situation uh, again. From from my modest personal experience uh, on this, and well, uh, in the past I've been involved in, in trying to um, work on, on, on this, I think that the latest thinking amongst several uh, states parties is exactly this, to try to put together kind of a hybrid model that has an open-ended part of all states parties and a limited part that really focuses on given issues and even the possibility of creating ad, ad hoc groups. John, I see that uh, you wish to uh, chime in here. Please do. Yeah, on the S&T uh, aspects that we certainly push that there needs to be a two part to this process. Ideally, you will need a small group of genuine experts in a particular field to review and assess and then report uh, back for a political level meeting to discuss. Uh, and it would be that group's task to bring to the attention at the policy level, these are issues you need to be aware of because these developments are coming, uh, these could be the implications, these might be some suggested actions that could be taken, uh, and that would have to be discussed and agreed at the policy level. The other model we thought that would be hand in hand with this, because over the years we've had a number of uh, issues uh, have come up and have been discussed in Geneva, um, where the, at the policy level they have concerns. Now these concerns may be misplaced, they may be exaggerated, but at least they could then commission a group of scientific experts, broadly drawn, uh, to go and look in depth at the issue and report back. Um, that needs to be uh, you know, part of this process. But we then um, run into the political problems again, that some states' parties didn't like the idea of a technical body uh, acting on its own, i.e. deciding what to, to write about 
um, so they don't like that approach. Then we have the silly argument about whether it has to be everybody or only a small group. Uh, it needs to be both. Um, and these are the kind of things that, that continually hamper the ability of the BTWC to, to agree on anything where you can expect something useful to come out of it. Thanks. Um, a, a question to anyone who really wants to take it up. In, uh, I think it was in 2014, uh, well, less than t 10 years ago for sure, um, there was a whole discussion around gain of function with uh, uh, the H5N1 um, being weaponized, to, to, to put it mildly, uh, to uh, modify it so it has different characteristics. And a whole discussion has developed since then. I think that that discussion is just going to get more fire in terms of how to protect research. I mean, do you think that it is possible to be able to still continue with the scientific um, uh, research and the ability to share it with among scientific communities, given that these kinds of insights into life uh, could be taken up by mal malevolent actors? How do we protect this kind of research uh, for it to go on, yet at the same time protect ourselves from it not being weaponized by malevolent actors. Yes, please, Matthew. So I want to go back to something you brought up. I have the highest respect for Philippa Lensos. She's a real scholar. Uh, and I don't, I doubt very much that she mentions this big number from a, a computer to mean that anything is hopeless in the area of arms control. After all, the Chemical Weapons Convention deals with that kind of problem with what's called the general purpose criterion. It's not that any particular chemical is specifically forbidden. It's that any chemical, even alcohol, the kind we love to drink, is prohibited if it's for a purpose that's not peaceful. So uh, this listing of thousands of chemicals Besides, I don't believe the number, but that's a technical question. So it's very important to keep in mind this very central part of the Chemical Weapons Convention, the general purpose criterion. As for hoping that we don't have a monster escape by accident from a lab. Now, there are two different routes. One is accident, and the other would be deliberate. So for accident, you have to establish safety protocols, and once this country establishes safety protocols, you need to have periodic review and inspection of laboratories. We do this here. Uh, I have in my department a review committee, and then at higher levels there are further review committees. I don't work with anything very dangerous myself, but if I were to do so, I would have to submit a detailed description. And then there should be, and there are, visits between people, regulatory people from different countries to try and keep this general standard pretty high. So I don't see these things as terribly difficult problems. You mentioned, Matthew, in, in, in another uh, occasion um, that um, there are different kinds of reviews. Uh, and, and I think that right now the US is doing a biodefense posture review. Um, you, you say there's basically three kinds of reviews. One is, well, you don't know much about uh, something and you review it so you find out more about it. Uh, a type of review where you know something about it, but you want to encourage more of a policy uh, discussion. And then um, you a type of review where you don't really want to do anything about it, so you review it uh, in order to, to kind of complement. Do you th what would be the type of review done today in today's climate of multipolarity and, and how do we go back to any domestic reviews being coming up with the conclusion that let's keep this uh, these kinds of weapons uh, out of uh, anyone's uh, reach? Well, any kind of review that's intended to prevent violations, first of all, has to have a legal basis. That is, if it turns out that you are not fulfilling the criteria, there has to be a penalty. So there has to be law that requires jurisdiction, and that's a whole separate topic, but we do this in all kinds of regards. Where I live, we have a swimming pool, and the city inspectors will come on Friday, and we can't use the pool until they 
uh, give approval. And if we did use it, there would be a legal penalty. So there are all kinds of activities. We have inspectors for plumbing, inspectors for elevators. Uh, most people who live in cities don't realize that there's an immense amount of inspection already going on. So first answer to your question is you need to create law with proper jurisdiction and penalties. Then you need to create rules for doing the inspection, etc., etc. So I think that uh, this can go a long way. In countries which don't do this, largely it may be because they can't afford to do it or they don't have sophisticated enough structure to do it. They need help from other countries. And in that respect, it means that the wealthy countries have to step up and create the, that kind of inspection. But um, I don't see this... I mean, the very fact that history shows that this doesn't happen every week. As I said, the anthrax letters is nearly 20 years ago, and there hasn't been even one copycat. So they worked anyway. I don't know about those that never worked because they don't come to notice. So Thanks. I think we handle this in the same way we handle violations of narcotic law, etc. Now there's a problem. There's money in narcotics. So if there was ever big money in favor of biological weapons, then you have a problem. But I don't see that that would ever happen. Thanks. Um, Sergei, I see that uh, you want to jump in on this. Please do. Yes. And I, I think this is, uh, this is a very valuable addition from that. Uh, that, uh, you know, while any single procedure can be useful, uh, it, if it remains just a single procedure in isolation, it would not solve the problem. It would help solve, but it wouldn't solve. Uh, and here, uh, I think uh, we should um, devote much more attention and imagination to the whole range of possibilities uh, of uh, domestic national implementation. Uh, and this is another uh, example of the OPCW and CWC, which could be useful, although there, uh, I think it's not being used uh, to the extent it should be. So which, uh, let's say, laws and regulations should there be uh, for the biological area? What are the standards? Because, of course, you cannot make uh, laws that would be absolutely identical in all countries because countries have different legal traditions and uh, cultures and so on and so forth. But what should actually they achieve? And there sh sh should be some guidelines to that effect. Uh, so th I think this is, this is another uh, area which uh, does require more attention and which would be, in my view, a fruitful addition uh, to um, different other procedures. Thank you. And, and we've come to, to my final question. And again, open to anyone who wants to jump in before we come to concluding remarks. Uh, but this is that uh, since the signing uh, in 72 and then ratification in 75, we're coming up um, in 2025 um, at a significant um, milestone in its, uh, in, its, in its ratification, the 50th anniversary, but it's also the 100th anniversary of the Geneva Protocol. Um, right in, in, in that period, the Biological Weapons Convention has shown itself to be um, a very strong uh, norm uh, against the use of biological weapons and, uh, and uh, the stockpiling and the development, uh, etc., uh, and it has strengthened itself uh, by uh, being innovative, first with review conferences every five years, uh, then a combination of confidence building measures, annual meeting of states parties, um, an implementation support unit, um, all these things that even when things didn't work out fully as some expected, other aspects were, were added to it. 
But for, for some, the, 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 the idea comes up again of, is it possible to have something like the OPCW in the CWC, an OPBW perhaps, or a Biological Weapons Convention organization? Do you think it is possible um, as we approach the 50th anniversary of the ratification and the 100th anniversary of the Geneva Protocols and the years uh, from now on to have that kind of a regime uh, support uh, to the convention? Anyone who wishes, please. Uh, John, please. Yes, go ahead. Um, the short answer is no. Um, that's based on, on years of painful experiences with, with this. But in principle, there ought to be things that could be done. I mean, one of the last things I did uh, before retiring from the, the Foreign Commonwealth Office was to draft one of the working papers that was uh, tabled recently um, at the, one of the meetings of states' parties. And this was to suggest that in terms of building the institutional uh, framework for the convention is that we should really start to think of the annual meetings as a sort of annual conference in the way that we have with the Board of Governors and the IEA and the uh, Conference of States Parties and the OPCW that would take decisions. Because mm-hmm. um, this has been one of the uh, big obstacles in the last 20 years that some states insist that only our review conference can take a decision on substance, which is nonsense because review conferences have derogated powers to other bodies such as the consultative um, meeting or to the special conference we had for the uh, after verics etc so if states could see their way clear to recognizing that these annual meetings should become glorified executive council slash conference of states parties that would take meaningful decisions uh, that would be a step on the road because one of the things on the on the biological side there are so many things that we need to be doing um, across a very broad spectrum that can't all be done under the framework of the BTWC. We have WHO, for example, we have FAO, uh, OIE, et cetera. We have things that need to be done on uh, biosecurity education. Uh, that's been a key topic for, for many years. So there are lots of things that we need to take action on because none of them on their own are going to solve the problem. Um, but I think a big starting point would be if the states could agree to take decisions annually and not wait every five years, this would be a significant development. But as I said at the outset, uh, I'd be very pessimistic that th- this would actually be possible. Because from some states, unfortunately, it's a case of all or nothing. That unless we have a protocol, then anything else uh, uh, we'd, we're not going to support, even though it would be useful. And if they were sensible, it would be a stepping stone to the kind of outcome that they would wish to see. But sadly, they're fairly myopic on that particular point. Thank, Thank you, John. John. Uh, uh, Sergei, please, please go ahead. Yeah. Um, I uh, wouldn't be able to be so categorically uh, negative about OPBW. Uh, but uh, for me, of course, the question is, or the point is rather, that it shouldn't be copied from the IAEA or the OPCW uh, in terms of the organization structure and other things. Um, it seems to me that there are two different aspects here, both already mentioned, but I thought I would try to do it um, well a bit more precisely, if I may. Now, one is that if you take the whole area of international interaction in the biological field, uh, apart from the fact that we have uh, WHO, the Animal uh, Health Organization, uh, uh, Food and Agricultural, uh, and so on and so forth, or legitimate. Uh, We also have um, an area of unclarity about, um, well, any possible dividing lines there. And the best example here is the question of the use of biological weapons. Uh, The Biological Weapons Convention itself, the, the text, does not contain the prohibition on use because at that time it was thought that this role was to be uh, played by 
the Geneva, the Geneva Protocol. Protocol. Yes, uh, exactly. Now, then, um, I forgot when it happened, uh, 2010 or something around that, there was uh, a conclusion of the another conference of states parties uh, to the convention, which basically said it's covered as well, but without uh, reflecting that in the text. So when then um, people come and say that uh, the verification of the verification, uh, the verification of the prohibition on the use in the convention uh, is to be conducted by, let's say, uh, United Nations Office on Disarmament, that makes a little legal sense to me. Uh, another thing is that uh, when there is a biological event, initially nobody, nobody can say whether it's deliberate use or not or something natural. So who starts? Uh, biological uh, weapons convention system or the WHO, which is also extremely reluctant to get involved into whether it, it was used or something else. So how do you address that? And then we also have uh, several um, aspects relating to biological safety or safety and security. Who does that? Uh, and we also have several proposals on the table about the agency for international agency for biological safety and or security. Uh, so I think there is a need for some mapping here. And coming back to the OPBW, uh, it seems to me that we should um, accept or to make an effort to accept that uh, for certain regimes like the BWC, we can create organization not on the basis of uh, all or nothing, but on the basis of what uh, is uh, possible and feasible at the moment. And in this regard, I'm quite sympathetic to what uh, John uh, said in his uh, previous uh, comments. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, it's it's very interesting that you mentioned uh, mapping. It's actually something that I'm exactly I'm, I'm working on as an academic paper to map the regime complex around it uh, and see what policy value uh, there is uh, in that. Uh, Matthew, if you allow me, uh, I saw that John uh, put up his hand if 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 uh, he wanted to kind of jump in on this and then we we come to you. Uh, so yeah, John, please, uh, you wanted to jump in on this point. Yeah, it was more on a historical point that the. Uh, fourth Review Conference in 1996 put in the final declaration that use was effectively prohibited by the, the Convention. That's where it comes from. But in fact, if we go back much further to the final year of the negotiations of the Convention, where the UK had tried to have an express prohibition of use put into the uh, draft Convention, uh, that didn't prove possible, both because of uh, US opposition and also um, Soviet opposition. Uh, the UK took the view that it, um, at the time that it was still effectively prohibited. But that has been embodied now in that um, review conference final declaration decision in '96, and that's been reiterated at every review conference since that use is prohibited by the Convention. That's all I wanted it's to add at this point. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, a common part, part of the common, common understandings, is there? Uh, please, please, Matthew. Matthew. Well, um, I want to make two points. One is how much better off we are now with the Chemical and Biological Weapons Conventions. I'm going to use the particular case of my country because that's what I know best. We had, of course, at Fort Detrick and other places, a program of trying to develop biological weapons. That was their job. They were under what's called the Army Materiel Command. They kept inventing things, but they never were accepted by the services, that is the Air Force or the Army or the Navy or the Marines, uh, so that they never came into real use. Nevertheless, that was the job of the people at Fort Detrick, is to try to come up with something that the Air Force, for example, might want and spend money to get. 
Now, without the Biological Weapons Convention, it could be that some bright person would finally invent some biological weapon that the Air Force would consider is predictable enough, deliverable enough, etc., that maybe they would spend their money to buy those things. But today, if anybody had such a bright idea in our country, it would go nowhere because they would be told, don't you remember? There's a treaty. You can't do that. So in other words, it cuts off development and acceptance at the level of the actual combat agencies, combat parts of a, of a government. And I suppose that there must be something like that in many other governments. That's very important because all of the weapons we have start out with somebody's idea and then development and testing and only then acceptance by a branch of the services, production and possibly even use. That's cut off now in most countries. The second thing I want to say is that the real problem, of course, is war itself. And so although there are scholarly researches into what causes war, I think it would be interesting to at least consider the possibility of looking at some of the more recent wars in the history of our, our species and trying to understand what could have been done to prevent them. What could have prevented the Vietnam War? What could have prevented the current war in Ukraine? What could have prevented the Iraq War? Very specifically, what could have prevented those wars? Because it's the wars that are holding back our species, diverting our attention and our wealth and our, 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 our mental abilities to create the kind of marvelous world that our great progress in science and technology, at least theoretically, makes possible. So I think that war itself is the big problem and that what we need to do is on a case basis at an international and a national level to take a few specific cases. I think I know what could have been done to prevent the Vietnam War, what could have been done to prevent the Iraq War, what could have been done to prevent the current war in Ukraine. But that's what I think we need to understand better and then ask what's that kind of basis in knowledge, how can we apply this? Thank you. Um, and, and this is the perfect segue into uh, inviting you to, to share some, some final thoughts on this. Let's go in reverse order to how we started. We can start with Sergei, then John, uh, then Matthew. And in, in, in that, I would encourage perhaps to share thoughts exactly along these lines of how do we convince policymakers in the, in the coming years that exactly this, that war is not the answer, that um, how do we create uh, perhaps an intellectual framework such there is for nuclear weapons in terms of strategic stability, um, but uh, not in this sense that there that the, even if there is military use and and I'm sure that many can find military use if not for humans uh, human disease, disease then perhaps for livestock for for agriculture how do we say no? To none of this in terms of uh, playing with the life sciences um, for um, for hostile uh, intent of any kind. How do we create this new framework that is necessary? Sergey, if we can come uh, start with you uh, and then John and then Matthew. Sergey, please go ahead. Uh, that is a great question and I'm very grateful uh, to Matt for formulating it actually. Um, I'm not sure I can give you a, an answer because each of those wars started because somebody wanted them to start uh, and a lot of things were being done in the run-up uh, and not just on one side or another side. It was kind of a collective effort, unfortunately. So to give just a recipe how to avoid or prevent wars is difficult, especially today, actually, 
because of so many changes that are happening uh, in the way we live, function, and think. Uh, many changes have or seem to have very little to do with wars or the use of military force, but rather with economy and social development and the impact of scientific uh, progress on uh, economy and social development. That's one thing. Um, another is uh, the limits uh, that exist or are lacking uh, of self-restraint that different countries uh, or leaders uh, collective leaderships uh, think uh, they can apply to themselves and to uh, the rest of the world. Uh, we have uh, in the last uh, kind of about 30 years or so, uh, this whole uh, system of checks and balances, often unwritten, has uh, deteriorated quite a lot uh, and what uh, was considered to be unthinkable and possible has become possible now uh, and this is the way how people think how people uh, think they could react to something that is happening and they don't like how they should react how it is uh, let's say not extremely expensive for them or maybe extremely expensive for them to react. So what are the checks and balances here? Uh, it also, of course, this question, uh, to which I don't think I can give an answer, uh, it also affects, of course, the B BWC in a more narrow sense, uh, namely uh, that and we discussed that uh, at the beginning of our session, uh, that there wasn't uh, in general much appetite for biological warfare. But this is about the period when biological warfare was, primitively speaking, conceived as putting microbes into some kind of uh, specifically adapted or designed bombs or uh, projectiles and firing or dropping them on the enemy. Uh, I, I, I think this is not no longer the most um, important or attractive way of waging biological warfare. Uh, we are now in a period when uh, it is considered uh, thinkable to conduct uh, warfare not through strictly speaking military means but uh, let's say economic suffocation of your competitor or uh, the opponent and it, it it has become increasingly uh, popular uh, and then even if you have an agreement on something you are unable to uh, dismantle uh, the whole system of sanctions, or it's very difficult. And this is what we are discussing now uh, in the case of, uh, or in the context of the revival of the Iran nuclear deal. So it's, 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 it's a wide range of uh, issues that are involved. And I think my mental capabilities are not enough to integrate uh, all of them. But the question was very well put. Thank you. Thank you very much for the incredible uh, insight into them. Uh, uh, John, if, if, uh, if I may with you, final thoughts. Final points. Well, I can certainly agree with Sergei's observations uh, there. I don't have the mental capacities to work out how we fix the problems that we, we face today. The, the tragedy is that since the end of the Second World War, the international community had built up a very broad range of institutions, uh, 
laws, norms were developed, tested understandings about how to conduct international affairs. I mean, there was quite a few hiccups along the way, of course. Uh, lessons were learnt and uh, future practice improved in some respects. But now we've got to the point where all of those instruments have have not been able to fulfil their underlying objectives. Uh, we've not been able to prevent wars. Um, that is the, if you like, maybe the tragedy of the human condition, despite the improvements, despite the fact that we're in the early 21st century, we're still confronted with the kind of problems in Europe we've got today, and not to mention all the other uh, challenges uh, from climate change uh, and others, etc. So the, the prospects seem to me pretty grim. Um, and if you add, I'll add to that, that there are people uh, who have considerable grievances, which they have nursed and amplified out of all proportion to, to reality. That's incredibly difficult to, to deal with and to counter. Um, at some point with wars, they have to come to an end and then you have to start to pick up the pieces and build something anew. Uh, and we may be in that transition point right now, uh, how the world is going to look in five, t 10 years time after what's been going on in Ukraine. Um, it's very difficult. The BTWC is a small part of this. It was one framework, a legal framework created to deal with the problem of biological warfare. Um, it's had its ups and downs, mostly downs in its 50 years. Um, the core benefit of the convention is number one, it prohibits biological warfare. It's, it's legally prohibited to do it. So we can hold individuals and states to account uh, through that. Uh, the second thing, is, of course, is the general purpose criterion, which was the, the great concept embedded in the convention and in the CWC, which makes the thing future-proof. So it covers all future scientific and technological developments. Um, nobody's going to be able to argue that this isn't covered by the, the convention. It, it, it will be. So those are the two crumbs of comfort I take from the, the convention. The Institutional failures uh, and likely failures, uh, I think, are going to be problematic. But those two core elements um, are worth clinging on to and uh, will provide some, some element of security um, in years to come. Thank you very much, John. Matthew, please. Well, it's heartbreaking to see our little species unable to give up this habit of war when there's such a wonderful world that could be created if there were no more wars, no more big wars. I don't have an answer. Maybe if we think hard enough about the causes of some of the more recent wars from the point of view of how they could have been prevented, what could have been done to have a different outcome, I think something might come of that but what somehow has to happen is to inspire the whole human population with the idea of what the world could be like if we could follow a path of peace and cooperation so that there's something some other objective I'm not very optimistic about this because I believe that our resort to war as frequently as it happens is deeply rooted in our evolution for reasons I won't go into but uh, I think it's there has to do well I won't go into it now uh, so I'm not too optimistic but we will get another chance you may smile at this but a hundred years from now 200 years from now 300 what's not much time There'll be a thriving human community on Mars and we get another chance. What kind of people go there? What kind of political, social arrangements are made? Uh, hard to say. But there's a huge future ahead of us. Uh, we're not doing too well on this planet. We could do better. I don't have much to specific to say about it thank you i i think that um bo all three ha have said quite a lot and provided arguments um and i've been in 
honored really to be able to be a part of this discussion and, and really grateful for the three of you for coming to the Diplomacy Light podcast. If I may end with, a, with a, some final thoughts to the viewers and listeners, to diplomats practicing uh, and incoming, but mostly to young people. Uh, arguments have been pre presented here that can be used in your domestic uh, processes, political processes, to be able to strengthen not just this convention, but global biosecurity. Use them, be active. Uh, and as uh, Matthew said properly, uh, we are on our way to become an interplanetary species. We are on our way to becoming an interstellar species. What kind of species uh, are we going to be as we take up uh, uh, humans in other solar systems? I think it's a discussion that is at the crossroads right now, and young people right now can be very active in shaping it, and they need to choose to do so. Thank you very much to all the viewers and listeners. Thank you very much to my uh, three guests. It has been an honor. This has been a Diplomacy Light podcast. All right. Thank you very much. This was uh, really a great conversation. I, um, obviously difficult uh, issues, but uh, perhaps we've given some ammunition, as I said at the end, to people to be able to use these arguments. But I think is, this is the key thing. Thank you very much, all three. Hey, welcome. It was good fun. Good to see your friends again. Yes, very good to see you. Good to see you. Indeed. Thank you.